and welcome to the introduction and status update on the general plan update effort. Thank you for joining us this Saturday, March 27th. My name is Julia Klein, project manager for the general plan update effort. And with us this morning are Christina Horsberger, community development director, and she will be leading the presentation. Um, also with us are Linda Lee, um, uh, associate planner, Linda, hi. And Brian Alexander, senior management analyst. Um, each staff will show themselves briefly so you can see them. Um, additionally, we have Mary Way and Aaron Fellers, our Zoom gurus who are managing the logistics of this virtual meeting. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> due to the uh, county health orders in place at this time, we are holding all public meetings remotely. The purpose of this meeting is informational and no decisions will be made today. Following the presentation, there will be opportunity to ask questions about the general plan update and about general plans in general. We have a large number of registrants. Right now we have about 39 this morning and we will do our best to respond to all the questions. However, if we are not able to do so within the time that we have, we will, you will be able to access a full list of the questions and our written responses on the project website at um, strivesanmateo.org. Um, the actual website will be shown on the presentation, so you can write that down as well. We will also be recording this meeting and we'll post it online in a few days. I'm going to do an attendee check. Uh, please note that all attendees will have their microphones muted and cameras turned off for this presentation. So please enter any questions that you may have in the question function, which is in the lower middle of your screen. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christina. Thank you, Julia. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today on this Saturday morning. We appreciate you all taking your time um, to be here with us and to learn a little bit more about the general plan. My name is Christina Horsberger, and I am the director with the Community Development Department with the City of San Mateo. The Community Development Department um, has a big task in the City of San Mateo. We do a lot of things, um, and our department is broken down into four divisions, um, which handle more four main topics um, of responsibility in the City of San Mateo. So we have our building division, which oversees construction and building permits and the built environment, mainly on private property. We have our code enforcement division, which deals with property maintenance. We have our housing division, which administers our affordable housing and housing assistant programs, and our planning division, which um, does plays a huge role in um, how the community takes shape and in creating a vision and a plan with community input for the future of San Mateo and with processing permits and um, conducting other business that helps to um, bring those plans into fruition. And so um, with that, before I get started, um, I wanted to ask a quick question of everyone. We're wondering um, how many that are with us today, this is your first time um, learning about the general plan or joining us for a general plan event. So if this is your first time, can you check yes? And if not, can you check no? And then we'll share that information and, and we'll use it to um, sort of gauge the level of information that we provide moving forward. Okay, looks like we have about an even split. So I'll cut, try to keep the information pretty balanced um, so that we um, can try to speak to everyone. And with that, we'll go ahead and move forward. So today we're gonna be talking about General Plan 140. Um, we're gonna start off with introduction to general plans and what general plans are. Um, from there, we'll go on and give you some information about what's been done for the general plan status update for general plan 2040. We've been working on it since 2018 and we'll share some information about what's been done to, da to date. We'll let you know how you can participate and what participation means um, for the general plan update. And then we'll talk a little bit more about next steps. So to get us started, what is the general plan? The general plan is 
an overarching document. Um, every city and every county in California has one and is required to have one. General plans um, are basically um, documents that are comprised of chapters, just like a book or a manual or um, any other kind of written document. Um, they're intended to provide guidance for how the city will grow and develop over time, generally a 20 year time span. They're comprised of elements, um, which most people would think of as chapters in a book. Each of the elements covers a certain topic. So we have eight elements um, in our general plan. They're land use, circulation, urban design, parks and rec, housing, conservation, and open space, safety, and noise. And so the topics and the discussions and the contents um, of those elements provide the vision for the city's material, how it will grow and develop over time. And that is reflective of community input um, that was conducted uh, or was obtained through um, conducting outreach when the last general plan was done. And so we've started doing that again for this general plan 2040. Um, and we have a vision for you that we'll share in a few minutes that was um, created through community outreach. So once we have a general plan in place, um, again, that's an overarching, very general document. It provides um, guidance for each of the topic matters in each of the elements. It's general, it has goals, it has broad policies, it has um, high level actions, and it really has um, a lot of broad information for how the city um, should, should progress over time. The way that we implement that vision and the way that we um, see those plans come into fruition um, on the ground is that we create other documents and other policies and codes and things that we use to implement that vision. So in some areas of town, we may have special considerations like the downtown. And so we have tools um, like specific plans where you can build off of the general plan to hone into a, a smaller level of focus and you can more customize um, the vision and the requirements and the policies and goals for a specific area. We have other tools also, um, we have policies and we have um, master plans and other kinds of plans. We have design guidelines that we use um, that may vary from place to place, but very importantly, we have our zoning code. And what our zoning code does is it provides the specifics for how we implement the general plan and to an extent also our specific plans over time. So whereas a general plan may say something like in this part of town, we want to see low density residential. What that means is a low number of residences per um, a given unit of space, generally an acre. And so the general plan would say something general like that. And the zoning code would say something like in this neighborhood, you can have one single family house per lot, or you can have a duplex or um, you can have a single family house or a duplex and it needs to be this tall and you can cover this much of the property. Um, and so it does get much more specific, um, lays down things like parking requirements and specific uses that can occur um, within a particular district. And so we go from general down to narrow and we focus as we move. And right now um, we're doing the general stuff and as we open that up, we will work toward um, amending our specific plans and our zoning codes to reflect what's in the general plan and so that we can implement it on the ground. So at this point, we wanna bring you to date with what's been done so far. The general plan was started or the general plan update for general plan 2040 was started in fall, winter 2018. We started by doing um, quite a bit of outreach um, and we got quite a bit of work done before we entered into the pandemic last year. So um, what we did do is we were able um, in summer and spring or spring and summer of 2019 to identify study areas within the city. Those study areas represent 10 distinct areas um, that were identified to be ripe for change of some sort. They're the areas that are concentrated toward um, main roadways and transit or areas that are known um, to need some sort of re-examining um, and so sort of the low hanging fruit in San Mateo, the areas where um, we will first focus um, looking at what kind of change may be appropriate. Um, after that, we looked at um, creating draft alternatives. So different scenarios that may um, occur, different land use scenarios that may occur within those study areas. So 
the alternatives look at things like um, population growth and job growth and number of housing units. And then I think uh, for 2018 and the kickoff I, I didn't mention, that I mentioned in our last slide, we also uh, worked with the community to create a vision for the general plan. And that actually is the basis for the things that come later. And all of the information to date is posted online. So anyone um, who hasn't been following what's been going on so far, you can visit our website at strivesanmateo.org uh, and you can look at um, everything we've done to date, including all of the meeting materials and you can watch videos. So that brings us to our vision statement. So this is one of the first things that was created um, through community outreach and through a lot of discussion, um, the values that are to be reflected in the general plan were created. So those values are diversity, balance, inclusivity, prosperity, and resiliency. And the vision statement was crafted to reflect that. So the vision statement says, San Mateo is a vibrant, livable, diverse, and healthy community that respects the quality of its neighborhood, fosters a flourishing economy, is committed to equity, and is a leader in environmental sustainability. So that's what we keep in mind as we move forward. And as we continue to hear um, from community members, um, we try to build off of this vision. And this brings us to the next step of what's been done so far. Um, I mentioned that we created um, with community input, the study areas, um, the areas that we thought were the most ripe to start studying. Um, we don't have a really good map for our virtual environment to show the study areas in a way that makes a lot of sense where you can really zoom in and zoom out and see any level of detail. So what we've done here is provided um, a map of all land or land use alternatives. These land use alternatives right now, the scenarios are concentrated within the study areas. So this visual here um, shows you the study areas, which are the areas that are colored um, in the context of the rest of the city, which is black and white. And so you can see here, um, the study areas move mainly from north to south. There are 10 of them all together. There are a few um, that move away from this sort of El Camino access. Um, and those are areas, again, that, that we've identified for one reason or another require um, further examination. So the colors in these um, different maps represent the different land use scenarios. So after the study areas or the areas delineated in this map were defined, then we started looking at what to study. Um, we're going to study a whole, whole bunch of things. Um, but we did base it on something. And so what we did is we went out to the community and um, we settled on three draft scenarios to begin our study. And those three draft scenarios, A, B, and C, or I should say alternatives, sorry. I am gonna use the word scenario later and it means something different. So I wanna be clear. These are actually the draft land use alternatives. So on the next slide, you'll see that the draft land use alternatives represent three different potential growth scenarios. So alternative A accounts for the least amount of growth with a little under um, 11,000 new homes in San Mateo, about 33,000 new residents, and about 15,000 new jobs. The job number is the same, or roughly the same throughout the three, um, throughout the three different alternatives, but what changes more um, is the homes and the population. So in alternative B, we have 15,800 new homes and 39,000 new um, residents, and in alternative C, we see closer to 21,000 new homes and closer to 58,000 new residents. And so this is gonna be important to consider as we continue to move through the process. As I mentioned, the general plan started in 2018. Um, originally, um, we thought that the end date for completion was gonna be a little closer, but um, for various reasons, um, our target date for completion at this point in time is 2024. And so um, in the intervening time, we've had a couple of things happen that change how um, we're approaching, um, how we work on the general plan. And one of those things is um, our housing element. I mentioned before that there are various chapters in the general plan and they're called elements. One of those um, chapters or elements that is required to be updated and that is um, closely regulated by the state is the housing element. And so, the completion of the housing element is going to be due about a year before the completion of the general plan. And so that's something that we're looking really closely at and that how we integrate that into our general plan. 
with the housing element comes a regional housing needs allocation. And what that is, it's a number that is handed down to the city and it says you need to create a pathway for X a number of residential units or houses. A unit is just another, another word for a house or an apartment or a condo or a house. Um, have to be accommodated within your city. So it doesn't say the city has to build them and the city is not the one who's gonna build them, but we need to have policies in place that allow for that many units to be able to be built. And so we're looking at that really closely with the general plan um, because we need to consider, uh, consider it in the context of um, the alternatives that are in place. And also we have um, the ballot measure, measure Y, which went through with um, different considerations in place that we need to look at when we look at those scenarios and how that plays out. And so right now um, we have our housing allocation number and we're studying that, um, crunching a lot of numbers. We're looking at properties individually and we're trying to see how that's gonna fit into the general plan. And so we'll be looking at, at that very closely um, in our general plan, um, January to June, 2021 activities as we look through the alternatives. Once we have um, more information, latter part of this year, we'll be looking more closely um, at the alternatives and seeing what we've heard from the community and how we can put that together to make a preferred scenario. And so what the preferred scenario will be is a land use scenario that's based on the input we got that puts together the different pieces of the different alternatives that we heard people want to see. And so the scenario is not going to be alternative A, B, or C. It's going to be a combination of those. And it might include things that we haven't talked about yet. And it might, um, it might show us that we need to approach our study a little bit differently. And we're not sure exactly what that's going to show yet because we're waiting for some of our um, housing element numbers. And we're also waiting to do outreach and to see what we hear from folks as we move through. Once that's done, we'll be looking at the draft goals and policies in in the general plan. That's something we've been looking at over the past year as we've paused um, during the pandemic. Our last land use alternative workshop was in March of 2020. Um, and so although we're picking up where we left off, um, we were doing other things in the meantime. Um, and so we've done a little bit of work. We have things in draft, um, but it's at this time now that we really plan to continue. And so that sort of speaks also to the purpose of this meeting, which is to get everyone up to speed because we are gonna be launching um, a lot of um, a pretty intense outreach effort, I would say moving forward for the next several months. We're gonna have a lot of meetings, a lot of workshops. Um, we're sending out mailers, we'll be conducting a survey. And so we really are going to be trying to hear from everybody. And the first step in that resumption of those types of um, more input driven activities are gonna be the recommencement of our, of our land use alternatives workshops. Um, so with that in mind, um, in order to do that, we really do near, need to hear from everybody. Um, and so the way that we form these plans, the way that we inform these plans um, and these visions for the future is we talk to the community. And so we get a lot of questions about um, who gets to stay, who is the community? And so um, it's the entire community. It's everyone who lives, works, and plays in San Mateo. Um, it's a, a common place where people use the same amenities and, and services where they commingle and where they also solve problems together. And so a community is made up of a variety of stakeholders. Um, and we really do um, hope to hear from the full array of stakeholders as we move through these proce processes because um, everyone's got something to say um, and it might be a little bit different um, and it's something someone else hasn't thought of and that we need to consider. And so we do wanna hear from everybody. We have um, residents, businesses, property owners. We have the people who come here and use our businesses and services. Um, people who work here, people who build here. Um, there are lots of organizations, um, there's neighborhood groups, there's folks who for one reason or another may not be able to participate themselves and they're represented by some other type of um, organization. And so we like to know that um, and we like to hear from everyone. And so what we did is 
we have another question for you right now. We put together one that um, allows you to tell us what kind of stakeholder you are. And so you can check as many as, as, as apply. So we wanna know, are you a resident? Do you work here? Do you have a business here? Are you a property owner or a patron? Or do you represent an organization or a group? Okay, wow, 99 or 91 percent residents. So we have a lot of residents here today. Um, it's a little. Uh, we still had mainly residents at our last workshop on Wednesday, but a little, little bit higher today. 68 percent um, are property owners. 40 percent work here. 25 percent own a business or use local businesses, and then 32 percent represent another group or organization. So an interesting interesting makeup, um, but a lot of residents, so um, a lot of people with um, a really strong stake in the community. So again, we wanna hear from all of you and we're gonna be trying to do that in a variety of ways. Um, we've tried to do that in a variety of ways to date as well. Um, and we'll continue that as we move forward. So in the past, um, we've had a series of community workshops, um, a series of public meetings, including those um, with the city council, the planning commission, and our general plan subcommittee. We posted a variety of pop-up events, such as the evening events on B Street last year. We did pop-ups at Fieldworks, um, at King Center, and um, a variety of other places. We've conducted surveys. We have a website with online exercises. We've received a ton of uh, written correspondence um, from a variety of um, of people who have an interest in the general plan. We've gone to uh, youth and government, to Spanish speaking communities, to the school districts um, and different um, types of organizations in the city. We've enlisted the Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center, um, PCRC for short, which um, provides facilitation and outreach services. And they've been helping us a lot to reach um, our underrepresented communities. And we are targeting special um, workshops and um, events toward um, groups who, who may speak another language and need some assistance, um, and also those who um, may not have been involved a lot to date and may need some additional information. And so that brings us to where we are moving forward. We have some um, different events planned coming up um, in the near future. We have two housing element um, introductory. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we have two, we have two housing element introductory workshops coming up. Um, and so you'll be seeing those as we as we move through. Um, sorry, I had a little mix up in my slide. Let's go back to the participation part. So we heard a lot from a lot of people to date. And so um, from those folks that we've heard to date, we've heard on um, a, a variety of topics. Some of the major themes that we heard about were traffic, um, parking, cut through um, traffic in neighborhoods, sidewalk and parking, um, and safety improvements like street lighting um, and crosswalks. We've also heard that people wanna see more parks and we've heard a lot, lot, lot about housing, including affordable housing and other kinds of housing. And so um, all of these are some of the things we expect to hear more about and expect to hear um, more nuanced perspectives as we move forward. But we also think we're gonna hear about a lot of different things that we haven't heard about yet. And so we're waiting to see how that looks as well. Okay, there we go. <laughs> that brings us to our community workshops. So we have a couple of community workshops coming up. Um, we have the housing element update. It's an introduction. We're gonna have two identical meetings um, next week, just like we did this week for the general plan. So we'll have one on a weeknight and one on a Saturday. I believe the dates are March 30th and April 3rd, and we'll post them um, in a couple of slides so you'll be able to see them. 
Um, we're also going to have some online exercises that are going up on our website. I mentioned we're sending out a mailer that's going to go to every person in the city. So please look out for that. We'll be sending it to property owners and occupants. So anyone who has a business or a residence here or who um, owns a property in San Mateo will get that um, will get that mailer. A little later in the year, we're going to be doing a statistically significant survey. So we'll hear from residents and we'll actually be able to validate um, the results of that survey and to share that with everyone. Um, after the introductory um, sessions, we are gonna be um, digging into more of the workshop and input driven sessions again. So I, I wanna again, just remind everyone to look out for those and to tell your friends, tell anyone you know that you see who has an interest in San Mateo, who lives here, um, who spends time and has an interest in the way that, that San Mateo develops. Um, bring them with you or tell them to go and we would be happy to see them and hear from them. So here we have just an example of our flyer. You may see this floating around as you go about your business as well. We are passing out a bunch of flyers. We're trying to get everyone um, involved and at least aware. Um, so we have um, English and Spanish language flyers going around. So if you see those, um, that's what it is. Um, it's inviting you to um, our future events and we hope to see you there. And so following the, the introductory, um, well, following this introductory sort of recap session and then the housing element one, as I mentioned, we'll start moving forward with the workshops. So the future step for that immediate future step um, is to get that land use scenario ironed out for these next several months. Um, so that we can conduct our technical evaluation. And so I wanna just make sure that I point out really, really clearly that at this point we're information gathering. We have a lot of analysis to do after we hear from everybody and um, we're not gonna make any decisions. No one's um, finalizing anything until we get to that point where we've heard from everyone, where we've done a technical analysis and brought it back in draft forms and had a lot of discussions about everything. So some of the things that will go into the technical analysis will be things like um, the amount of development we're gonna see, what is the character of the different neighborhoods gonna look like, we're gonna look at the traffic impacts of the preferred land use scenario. So depending on what amount of growth, what does that mean for the city? Um, is it gonna displace residents? Are we gonna see more residents? Um, what's it gonna do to our infrastructure? What's it gonna do to the services that we use to support the city and the things that we provide here? Does it have impacts on the fiscal health of the city? And so there's a lot of different things that we're gonna look at and the outcome of all of that is gonna be contained in all of the elements of the general plan. And at the end of it all, um, we have a complete comprehensive planning guidance document that sees us through, through 2040. And so that's what we're working toward. And um, with that, that will bring us to our last slide where we have the schedule for you, I think in a way that's a little bit easier to read. So again, we have our dates for our upcoming meetings, um, March 30th and April 3rd for the housing element, and then for the land use alternatives um, workshops, April 15th and 17th. I would also mention um, that we're gonna be holding a general plan subcommittee meeting as well. We don't have that one planned yet, um, but the general plan subcommittee is, um, city officials that were appointed into a subcommittee that looks specifically at, at general plan issues. And so um, we'll be announcing a date when we have that. We'll have it on our website. You can see down here at the bottom, we have our email and our general plan, so you can reach us. Uh, our general plan website, www.strivesanmateo.org, contains a bunch of information. We're updating it all the time. We're posting more and more stuff, including interactive tools. We have an interactive map that's gonna go there so you can zoom in and out in detail and look at the land use alternatives um, and that will help to prepare for the workshop so that you'll be ready um, to have an informed discussion when you get there um, in addition to the tools that we'll have um, when you arrive. And so um, again, we're gonna be sending out a mailer and we encourage everyone to read that, share that if you have anyone um, who you wanna share it with and um, contact us if you need anything or have any questions. So with that, um, we will bring it to our question and answer. Um, we're doing a webinar. Um, it's difficult to manage conversation. So we will be having um, Linda Lee read the questions and I'll be responding to the best of my ability. Some may have to wait till a little later, 
just before we get started, um, we have two last questions for you. And this really goes back to the outreach component. We want to know how you learned about today's session um, so that we can focus our outreach moving forward. So we're wondering, did you hear from our email newsletters through social media, through daily journal, print, or digital ads? Um, in-person outreach, a homeowners association, neighborhood community group, other group, or word of mouth? Okay, that's what we heard the other night too. A lot from our e-newsletter, 79% heard from our e-newsletter. Um, it looks like we also um, have a big showing from homeowners associations, in-person outreach, community groups, other groups, and social media. So that is helpful to know. We appreciate that feedback. Um, we have one more question for you. And that one involves how do we reach you best in the future? I have a feeling I'm going to see e-newsletters in there. <laughs> e-newsletters, social media. So you have the same options here. Yep, 95% e-newsletters. So we know that's a good way to reach folks and we'll continue to do that. Um, and also explore other ways aside from the ways that are um, identified here. So social media, again, homeowners associations, um, community groups about the same makeup. So we'll continue to do that and we'll look at other ways to do that as well. With that, I will go into our question and answer session. As Julia mentioned in the beginning, we will answer as many questions as we can. Um, there may be some that we can't answer for whatever reason. We may need to do more research. Um, we are going to post the answers to all of the questions and the questions themselves online um, from the last meeting and from this meeting. Um, everything should be posted within the next week or so. If there is anything that we do not get to that we're unable to answer or if we were to run out of time, we're still going to answer the questions and post it online. So you'll be able to see whatever we discussed and um, anything that we didn't get to complete our discussion on um, will be available on our website in the coming week. So with that, um, Linda, can you go ahead and get us started? Yeah, thanks, Christina. And thank you all for continuing to stay with us as we move into Q&A. Again, you may enter your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I will read the questions in the order they are received. So our first question, uh, the speaker only mentioned in the zoning plan section of her talk about residential areas. What about business areas and the zoning required of those businesses, not just residences? So yeah, it, so the, the land use designations account for all kinds of, of land uses. That was just an example of how it would go from a general level to a specific level. So the same would be um, true of a commercial district. Um, you may see something like a general commercial designation, but then when you look at the zoning code, it would say something like C1 or C2 or C3 or service commercial. And it would go a little deeper and it would say what kinds of businesses could be there. And the same is true for the variety of land use of categories. You may see one that says public facilities and you may look um, at the map and it might have um, a variety of a specific type of public facilities that could be there and parameters that are associated with it. So um, that logic does carry through to all of the different um, types of land uses that exist in the city. Next question. In the different alternatives, what is the new population ratio to new planned housing? Is it the same? Okay. 
So I'm, I'm not exactly sure that I, that I understand the question. So what we're doing is we're looking at three different potential land use scenarios and each of those potential land use scenarios does come um, with a projected um, number of housing units um, and with a projected, yeah, with a projected number of housing units. And so if you look at housing or land use alternative um, B, A, B, and C, they each have a different number. And so for land use alternative A, the projection is 10, or 10,910 new houses with 33,050 new residents. And so for B, it's um, 15,800 and 39,200 respectively. And for C, it's 20,858,300. ,000, and so there is a proportionality to each of those land use scenarios. It's not a projection that we're making. There are different scenarios that we're exploring. If growth happens this way, then this is what we need to study and this is how we could accommodate it. And so that's something we're still working out and that we would consider um, in general um, as we move through and more specifically. Next question. Right now, the affordable housing units are behind in most of the cities on the peninsula. Is this being considered? So um, as we move through the general plan process and the housing element process, um, we do look um, at not only what our requirements are, but also what we can accommodate and how and where the community wants to see that growth. Um, housing is one of the things we hear a lot, lot about. Linda, can you just go back up to that question? There we go. Um, and so I want to make sure that, that um, I, I point out that the city of San Mateo is not the producer of the housing. So what we're doing is we're paving the way for the folks who do build housing to come in and build it. And so we do keep where we are in the affordable housing market in mind all the time. We have programs in place that address affordable housing. Um, the city just partnered um, with MidPen to construct affordable housing sites or an affordable housing site downtown. So all of that is definitely um, at the fore of our mind as we move through um, this process. With the housing element, there actually are affordability requirements. So um, our housing element um, requirement, the arena that I discussed earlier, more than doubled from the last cycle to the current cycle. So for the, the housing element, we do it every eight years. And eight years ago, we had to pave the way for 3,300 new residential units. And um, for this cycle, over 7,000. And with this cycle, there's an affordability requirement that um, a lot, I wanna say more than half of our allocation toward different ranges of affordable units. So it is something we're gonna be keeping in mind um, very prominently as we move forward and that I know the community will also be thinking very um, strongly about. Okay, uh, next question is from Nancy. My biggest concern is height restrictions. The higher the new buildings, the less feeling of community and more of urban sprawl. Are there height restrictions that the city has overall? Yes, the city has height restrictions overall. They vary from district to district and um, from land use type to land use type. And so that is a big concern for a lot of the community. Um, it is something that we will be looking closely at um, along with the numbers of units that can be within a given um, unit of space. And so we are gonna be looking at that very closely. And I know we're gonna hear a lot about that from the community and we're gonna have to be careful about how we fold that into um, how this document shapes, um, comes to shape and um, we'll have to see what it means, um, especially in terms of um, our housing element and what we need to accommodate for um, and our study areas. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we're still looking at a lot of uh, numbers and doing a lot of analysis um, and that will be something that we will present and talk about more. So next question is from Ellis. This is regarding the latest RENA numbers for the city of San Mateo. I believe you mentioned it earlier, but if you want to just quickly say it again. So our, our, our RENA allocation is a little over 7,000. 
Um, as I mentioned, there's also a breakdown of affordability that we have to um, provide a certain number that can accommodate uh, different levels of affordability. And we have to provide space for someone to come in and build if those affordable units don't get built in the, in the sites that we've identified for them. So what that means is we also have to provide a buffer. So even though our minimum number that we have to show um, to the state where we can accommodate those housing units, it's a minimum, but it isn't actually the actual minimum because we have to have space for more in case that doesn't happen. And so um, the number is, is seven, a little over 7,000, but I think um, the actual number is, is higher that we have to account for. And the buffer, the buffer, um, it's under consideration now. Um, it's a wide range. I don't know if you had a chance to tune in um, to the January um, city council meeting. The state guideline is 15 to 30%, but we think it's probably closer to 50, um, but it'll depend on what comes out when we do more study. Um, and that'll be all ironed out in public. And so that's not something that staff would make a call on. That's definitely something that we would present and um, discuss with the community. So next question from Michael, please provide an example of someone who does not work or live here, but does play here. Okay, so um, one example um, would be, we did um, a pop-up event for the Dio de los Muertos um, King Center event last year. And we talked to a lot of people um, who were there for the event and who did not live or work in San Mateo. And so we do ask um, when, we, when we do our outreach, we do ask to try to get um, an idea and then we, we track um, what people's interest is, is in the community. And what we heard from a lot of people is that San Mateo has really great restaurants and really great parks. And that even though um, they don't live here, they spend a lot of their time here and they use the services here and they leave their own cities to go to San Mateo to eat, to go to the shopping mall, to go to the parks, to walk and to do other things. So that would be one example of folks who might play here but and, and, and contribute in some way to the economy, but not live um, or work in San Mateo. So next question, what kind of projections are provided regarding the number of commercial or business units required in certain districts? Sorry, I'm gonna turn off my camera for a minute. I'm getting some um, signals or some messages that my internet signal might, be, might not be that good. Let me know if okay. you want me to reread the question, Christina. I'm sorry, so the, thank you. So the question is, what kind of projections are provided regarding the number of commercial or business units required in certain districts? So we don't, a required number of commercial or business units. Um, when we looked at the general plan, um, it looked at different land use categories in different ways. And so when we look at residential land use, it does lay out um, the intensity of development in terms of um, number of units per unit of space. When we look at commercial or business districts, we look at floor area. So how many square feet of building do you get per unit of space or, or based on the size of the lot? So it's not done in number of units. It would be something like, um, you know, your, your floor area ratio is two and your lot size is 10,000. If you have a floor area ratio of two, that would mean you would get 20,000 square feet of floor area. So that's just an example. I'm not tying that to any particular type of land use, but that's how the floor area ratio number works. It's based on your lot size, it's a ratio and it determines your allowable square footage. So that's how we figure out what can go there and how much can go there. And what that's gonna mean for the general plan update is gonna depend on what we hear for, for the different districts. Um, it's gonna depend on on how intense um, the community wants the different commercial districts to be, and if that translates into changes in the floor area, which it very well may. Next question, what effect would the state legislator passage of bills like Senate Bill 9 and Senate Bill 10 have on this process and what our general plan says? 
does it reflect the state or what San Mateo wants for its future? So these Senate bills are something that we've been looking at um, and we've been talking about them. They do um, provide streamlining procedures and take away um, some of the discretionary review in order to, to accomplish that streamlining. Um, we're not exactly sure what it's gonna mean for us. We don't know if it's gonna pass yet. And so um, we'll have to study it more. We'll have to see what it's gonna mean um, and how it might play out with our land use categories. Um, I think a lot of what these particular bills would do would be um, to our process. Um, so I'm not sure how much it would uh, impact the general plan itself, um, but it may very well impact some of the procedures that we have in place that implement the general plan. Um, and so we'll have to see what it means. Um, you know, I, I can't say what exactly what San Mateo wants for its future. I think that's really up to um, the folks in the community who represent the community and who, who live there. And so um, I think that that's probably something that remains to be seen as we move through this um, and depending on what happens with these two Senate bills. Next question. What outreach was done by staff for our wheelchair bound residents and those who face the many mobility challenges throughout the city? So we've done a variety um, of outreach as I described earlier. A lot of that um, had to do with going places and going to places where people are and we continue to do that. Um, staff does that and Peninsula Conflict Resolution Center, which I uh, mentioned earlier helps us with that. They've been going to COVID testing centers, vaccination centers. We're talking now about doing more tar targeted outreach where we go to different places where we can find different members of the community or segments of the community who maybe have had a tough time participating. Um, I think these virtual meetings will help with some of the folks who maybe have some mobility um, limitations that, that have historically kept them from participating in public procedures. We also have our interactive tools. As I mentioned before, we're doing a mailing to every um, resident, business owner, and um, property owner in San Mateo. And we're also going to be um, conducting a survey that will go to um, the entire community. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities for input. The more that we hear, the more that we know where we need to go and where we might be missed. And so I would say um, we are trying to reach all communities, including those with mobility challenges. If you have a specific situation, we would love to hear um, any suggestions you might have for how do we can um, improve our outreach to those communities. Um, sometimes we don't know that um, we're not reaching someone until we hear from someone who knows they didn't, they didn't hear from us. And then we can try to target it better. Um, and so um, I, I would say that a lot of our um, remote tools um, um, and a lot of our targeted outreach and we're willing to do more um, if we hear something that um, we think will work and that we hear there's a need for. Great. Next question, it's also regarding the mailers and the surveys. So from mm -hmm. Lisa, mm -hmm. when will the mailers arrive? When will the survey be launched? And the mail? Yes. I'm sorry, was there another part? Yeah, she had a second question following that. So I'm just gonna throw it in there too. Uh, can we post the links to the flyers today for them to share? Um, uh, this is Julia, hi. <laughs> um, the mailers already went out. And so I think it depends on the USPS delivery. Um, different people have um, received them already and some have not, you know, but it should be coming through the US Postal Service. Um, the flyer information, you know, is really pointing to um, the website. Um, and so we can certainly give you the direct link to the website um, and post it here in, in a, uh, shortly. Oh, and one question was, when will the surveys be launched? Part of Lisa's question. The surveys will be coming as we get a little um, deeper into the process, I would say within the coming year, um, possibly later this year, but maybe early next year. Uh, we wanna make sure that um, our questions are meaningful and that we've um, provided enough education and heard enough back from the community so that we ask the right questions at the right time. So I would say sometime within the next year or so, probably the, the latter part of that, not, not the next several months or not the next, not the next like four to six months, but after that. 
So we had a comment from Lisa who mentioned that their mailer actually arrived already. So that's, thanks for letting us oh, know. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question from Ronnie. What value will our general plan have given the push at the state level to override our local process? So again, the general plan provides a broad roadmap. Um, it provides um, a vision and the guide for the things that, that um, the community wants to see in the community. There are some things that the state um, has overridden and that they may continue to. The state is um, you know, passing legislation all the time that, that does impact local municipalities, um, but there's still a lot that we can do. And there's a lot of policies that we can look at and that we can make that can make the community better and that can protect the community. And, um, and so I get how it can feel that way, particularly with all of the legislation that's been coming um, through recently. And that's um, been the impetus for a lot of change in how cities do business. But I think there's a lot of places where um, the community still can provide a lot of meaningful input and the general plan is one of those because there's lots of things um, that we can still shape. And so um, I think it will be extremely valuable. Next question. Staff should inquire uh, through a poll how many residents who rely on mobility devices such as wheelchairs are participating in today's and future general plan meeting. Today, we responded to questions related to stakeholders, but I did not see a poll asking how many people in attendance require mobility devices. Um, thank you for that comment. We will take that along with the other one we heard into advisement and we'll see what we can do to get better at that. Uh, next question from Lisa. Can you please share more about what will be going on at the housing element in future scenarios sessions? Mm -hmm. So the housing element sessions will be two identical sessions um, and they will basically um, be like a primer on the housing element. This is what it is. This is how it works. This is what it means for San Mateo. These are the factors that we need to consider. Um, these are our constraints. These are the things that we can look at and this is how you can participate. And so it's gonna be a lot like this one, only the topic is gonna be the housing element. Of course, um, there will be some general plan information is that one as well, since the housing element is a part of the general plan and you can't separate the two. And so there's gonna be a little bit of crossover in all of the sessions. So um, it will be mainly educational. Um, the future scenario sessions are the uh, resumption of the land use alternative workshops. And so that is gonna be um, getting community input on the three land use scenario, or the land use um, alternatives we talked about we talked about earlier and then with the impact or the input from those then we would um, use that to inform the scenario the draft scenario that we end up presenting um, a little later on after the workshops and a lot of um, the interactive things that we have planned have been completed next question from maxine will curtain current capacity of basic services such as water availability, sewer service, parks, schools, and transportation be identified, given the large population increases of the various alternatives. Also, what options exist for addressing these services? These could affect which alternative gets chosen and not be left until the end with the environmental impact review or report. So those are all things that we would study once the scenario has been established. Those are very technical, very in-depth analyses that would need to take place. They're very resource and time intensive. And so um, one of the objectives of um, out the alternatives and then going out and doing the outreach to um, figure out what the preferred scenario is gonna be is so that we have a way that we can focus our study. So when we go down deep and start looking at really technical things like the, in the technical evaluation that I talked about a little bit earlier, that we can really, um, we can really focus um, down on those things and look at them for a scenario that um, is something that we know that the community wants to see so that we're not using those resources to study things that might not happen. So we are going to do that, um, but it is gonna come um, once the scenario has been established um, and it would happen um, as part of the environmental impact report 
before the environmental impact report. So we'd have to figure out what the impacts are and then how we can address those. So it's, it's gonna be all around the same time, but um, unfortunately that's not something we can do for each alternative. Um, it's just, it, it's too in depth, um, very detailed. And um, it makes a lot more sense to do it once when we have an idea where we're going. And then depending on what we find, we could adjust that. Next comment from Nancy. Traffic is huge issue too. Living in North Central, there is already a lot of incoming traffic off third coming through the neighborhood. Parking has become a major issue with density housing already here and occupants having difficult time finding enough street parking beyond their existing housing parking allowance to accommodate their vehicle. Thank you for that comment. Your comment is noted and we'll, we'll keep it in mind. We hear that a lot from a lot of different community members. And so we definitely are aware that that's something we need to consider. And um, this is Julie. I wanted to add on to Christina's comment. Um, if you sign up for the uh, land, the scenarios uh, workshops, we're talking about at that workshop, um, land use alternatives as well as circulation alternatives. And so your comments regarding uh, parking and circulation would be most appropriate for those workshops. Next question from Michael. Why is the composition of the subcommittee limited to commissioners and counselors? That's um, too narrow a group. I'll go ahead and answer that since um, I was there when the uh, discussion happened at um, the uh, public hearings, um, public meetings, deciding on the composition of the general plan subcommittee. So what we were hearing um, prior to the general plan um, launch, well, we were hearing from a lot of community members who participated in the downtown plan and, and early feedback from uh, different segments of our community. What we were hearing is basically that um, the traditional form of a citizen's advisory committee is actually limiting. A lot of our community members who have not been able to participate because they're, uh, for different reasons, sometimes they're holding multiple jobs, they cannot necessarily, um, or, or you know, there's language barriers or they're caring for um, children or elderly, but there are a lot of other um, in different reasons why voices and perspectives of individuals are not represented sometimes um, when it's a select group of uh, citizens that are sitting on a citizens advisory committee. San Mateo's own local experience with the last citizens advisory committee was for the road corridor uh, plan. That was a three year effort. So residents needed who participate in that were basically asked to commit to three years, about 30 some odd meetings. Um, and so a lot of that was discussed during the city council meeting when the idea was uh, discussed, you know, whether to include citizens, um, how many citizens to include, you know, what, what are the representations and how is that group of individuals going to appropriately represent all the different stakeholders in San Mateo, including those who have traditionally not been able to participate. And so during the public meeting where the council and you know, her members of the public in different perspectives, there was a decision made not to do that and instead to focus in on elected and appointed um, council members and commissioners from Parks Commission, uh, the Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission, Planning Commission, and two representatives from the City Council. We also included um, a representative from the San Mateo Foster City uh, School Board. And the other part of it, so this goes hands in hand. We have the General Plan Subcommittee, but the other part that we're trying to do, and we're, we've been um, listening to community input and adjusting the way that we do outreach, we're trying to reach as much as possible all the different voices, all the different stakeholders in San Mateo. Not everybody can make every single type of workshop or virtual meeting, but what we're trying to do is go to those who cannot come to, to these types of traditional meetings. And so we are fully welcome to uh, take any ideas that people have. Um, and for those that made the comment regarding mobility, I also wanna mention that the city applied for a grant to begin a complete streets plan work. Um, the idea for that is to look at that whole entire uh, network of um, how people travel around, all the different modes. Mm -hmm. And if there's interest in that, if you could provide your contact information, uh, once we start on that process, we definitely wanna reach out to you and make sure that we include that perspective in that effort.
Thanks, Julia. So next question, it's from actually both Michael and Lisa. Uh, they were wondering if we would be providing a recording of this session and also uh, the presentation slides. Yes, everything will be posted online at www.strivesanmateo.org. Great. Next question from Joe. What is the city doing to streamline and improve the building permit process? I continue to hear that the permit process is very lengthy. That is something we are working on every day. Um, we're doing all kinds of things um, to try to make our process smoother and easier for people to use. We look at our codes and how we apply them and how we might be able to reapply them to make procedures easier and to make the um, submittal requirements less onerous while still having the level of review and detail that we need to have in order to make sure that buildings are constructed safely. We also are looking at our submittal procedures um, and at our guidance and handouts. So right now we're in the process of updating some of our handouts to provide more user-friendly information, more snapshots, so at a glance kind of flow charts and fees that you might have to expect as you move through the process. We're also looking at how and when we provide information to our applicants and how we can get them clearer information more quickly so that um, it's easier um, to respond to us. And so that's something that's really high on our radar and it's a really high priority and we are always um, looking at things. If you have something specific, we'd love to hear from you, but um, we are consistently looking for ways to streamline. And we've made a lot of changes lately. Um, we'll continue to make more. Next question is from Carol. Can we take advantage of Prop Y allowances for increased height limits with the Board of Supervisors approval? So when it comes to land use, the Board of Supervisors um, are the overseers of land use within the unincorporated county within the city limits. It's your city council. And so um, I think someone mentioned heights earlier and we will be looking um, at a variety of things um, as we move through the general plan and the land use um, alternatives and heights and densities will, will play prominently into that study and outreach. So we will be looking at that. Next question from Lisa. You mentioned a statistically valid survey coming out in the future. Is that going out to San Mateo residents only or will it also go to other slash all stakeholders? You know, that's a great question. Um, I need to look, we did one before and I'm not sure if it went to um, residents or residents and property owners. I think we are looking at repeating the methodology. And so that's one of the ones I'll have to look at and see exactly who we included. Um, and we will make that information available. Next question from Joe. Given the past year of COVID, what is the city doing to try and help downtown merchants survive in this environment? So the city has actually done, um, made a lot of adjustments to adapt to, to COVID. Um, in the downtown, um, you may have noticed that there's a, a lot of outdoor seating. There are a lot of parklets out there. Um, we have relaxed zoning standards on private properties outside of downtown so that folks can have outdoor seating there so that restaurants can continue to operate. Um, there's been a time when um, through different changes in tiers, different kinds of businesses have had various levels of operation allowances and we've adjusted to that. We've done a lot of education um, to our downtown merchants, um, letting them know what things they can and can't do and trying to be flexible and accommodate the things we can, that they can. We're also looking um, at the vacant spaces downtown and we're studying that right now to try to see if there's some things we can do in the near term before the general plan is completed. And we really look at our downtown specific plan. We're looking at in the meantime, is there something that we can do um, to help businesses um, come in and stay in, in the downtown units. And so we did have a study session recently with city council and we'll be having another one, um, I wanna say in May or so, Maybe it, it could be early June, but I'm thinking in May where we'll talk more about that. And so if you have an interest in that, you can let me know and we'll make sure you get on our notification list. Next question also related to COVID. Uh, what considerations are being given 
to changing demographics, such as more work at home scenarios, which impact housing and traffic. Given these changing demographics um, occurring because of the pandemic. However, it is predicted that even when the pandemic is over, some of these changes will remain. So we're paying close attention to that and we'll continue to pay close attention to that. Um, it is a really, really strong consideration, but we don't know enough yet to know how that's gonna look. So right now we hear a lot of predictions um, and you know we have our own observations that, that we can see that there probably will be more people working from home. But at the same time, we haven't seen any slowdown um, in an in interest or activity in constructing things like new offices. And so it's going to be interesting to see how things play out over time, but I think it's too early to say. So um, the considerations that are being being given is we are paying close attention. We've talked to economists and various other professionals and we'll continue to do that as we move through to make sure that we stay on point um, as, we, as we move through the, the process. But I think we don't have enough information yet to really know what it's gonna look like. Um, we haven't seen any slowdown yet. Next question, what is planned for ADU and junior ADUs? Um, So I think that's probably related more to our um, recent zoning ordinance amendment maybe that's going through. So for those of you um, who aren't familiar with ADUs and JADUs, an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. Um, a lot of people think of them as a granny unit or an in-law unit and it's basically um, a second residential unit that can go on a lot where there's already a house and in some cases already a multifamily um, type of development. A junior ADU is um, a smaller version of that that's inside the walls of an existing house. So it doesn't have to be, um, it, it, it's not separate and it's not something that's newly constructed. And so um, we are updating our ordinance for ADUs and JADUs. Those will factor in into the general plan um, as we look at our housing element. Um, a certain number of the ADUs and JADUs that are created will be used um, to count toward um, our regional housing needs allocation and how many we can count has yet to be determined. It's based on a formula that looks at the past of the city and predictions for the future. And we're, we're figuring out what exactly that means. And so um, in terms of how they affect the general plan, um, we'll see some amount of them will count toward the units we have to um, pave the way for for our arena, but we don't know how many of those units we can count yet. Next question from Carol. What are we doing to pass or to press RENA to reevaluate housing numbers based on current circumstances? Uh, there are lots of for rent signs all over the city. They should at least put the demands on hold for a couple of years rather than impose unrealistic eight year mandates. Uh, we should hold temporarily to understand these ongoing changes. So at this point in time, we're moving forward um, with our housing element process. We haven't seen any back down from the state or any real flexibility from the state um, in terms of re-examining the numbers. Um, I haven't heard anything about any um, extensions or anything like that. It is in our interest to comply with our arena requirements. Um, someone asked um, at the workshop we held on um, Wednesday, what the implications were of not meeting the arena numbers. And so I think it's important um, to understand that if we don't meet our, um, our housing element requirement, it puts the city at risk of losing funding for our um, housing support programs, a lot of our circulation projects. And so things that have to do with a variety of infrastructure and housing funding um, things that we work on at the city we would be ineligible for without a certified housing element. Um, we also would be open to litigation from folks who might want to build here and can't because um, we didn't meet our arena and maybe the rules that we have in place don't allow um, for the construction of the type or the amount of housing someone wants to build. And so the arena numbers are not tied to the vacancy rate of rental housing. It's tied to how many new housing units the state has determined um, we need to create a path for to be constructed. 
and again, just to clarify, not for the city to construct, but to be constructed by folks who come in and want to build things on private property. And so um, I'm not seeing that we have a ton of flexibility um, with those numbers at this point in time. And so our plan right now is to move forward and stay the course and comply with the state requirements because that's what we're legally obligated to and not doing so could put us at risk for other things. Next question. What is the city doing to try to match the demographics of comments and feedback in terms of owner, renter, race, gender, et cetera, with the demographics of the city to achieve the most representational or representative input? So if I may, um, this is Julia Klein again. Um, so we welcome input from everybody, regardless of the format, um, regardless of who they are. Um, what we've heard in terms of some of the comments that we received is that with the history of um, uh, segregation, there's a lot of history of how land use patterns has negatively impacted or more severely impacted certain areas in San Mateo versus others. Certain questions such as what race are you um, may be considered part of that history of um, sort of uh, discrimination. So we're sensitive in trying to make sure that when we're getting, um, when we're asking community members for input and uh, some of these conversations are happening one-on-one, -on -one, um, we, we will ask some of these questions verbally, but if they don't want to answer, they don't have to. Same thing with gender. Gender is also an issue. You can ask an individual, but if they don't want to tell you, that's fine also. At the end of the day, what's actually more important for us is getting the input about the issues that are concerning them, the issues that resonate you know, across different demographics um, and different groups. And so when different uh, community members come to us and say, you know, safety is a concern in my neighborhood and here are the specific reasons, those are the issues that we're trying to focus on and trying to find commonalities. Now, if individuals who are providing comments want to share their gender, whether they're um, the race, um, that's fine. We, we will certainly document that information, but they don't have to provide that information. So what happens is it, it will be difficult for the city to match demographic information with comments if individuals are not willing to provide that information. Next two questions from Lisa related to affordable housing. If the general plan identifies areas for affordable housing, and it turns out that market rate housing is built there, what recourse exists? The second question also from her, do you consider home sharing as part of zoning, especially for affordable housing? Um, oh, go ahead, Christina. Go ahead, you can go ahead. Um, if I may, with the, uh, the general plan, what we're trying to do with the general plan is identify sites for housing. We're, um, we will need to kind of look into, through the housing element work, we will need to look into what the state's requirements are in terms of, you know, once we identify the sites, how many of those units uh, distribution wise would need to be affordable housing units. Um, there's a lot of uh, different regulations coming down from the state uh, regarding the affordable housing units and, and what those target numbers need to be. We're working through those requirements so we better understand that and can, um, can dig into the, the data analysis work. And so right now we don't have that information, but it's a really good question for us and we'll note it for the future work that we're doing with the housing element. Um, in regards to home sharing and whether that is part of the zoning, no, home sharing is a program that currently the way that it's, it's run is actually by a nonprofit agency that's uh, servicing a lot of different communities in San Mateo County. Um, our, the city's zoning requirements does not prohibit a homeowner from home sharing. Um, and affordable housing units, home sharing is a, a way sometimes. And what we've heard is that um, homeowners who open up uh, bedrooms and share their homes with other, um, other residents, those, those rents are probably lower than typical independent uh, units. So it is um, a type of affordable housing unit. However, if your question is whether the state counts that, we have not seen um, any information regarding home sharing as a way of counting and meet a, meeting uh, affordable housing unit requirements. 
So I would just build a little bit off of the affordable housing if it turns out market rate housing gets built instead. Um, what it means is that we have to be able to account for that affordable, those affordable units someplace else. So that speaks to the buffer that I mentioned earlier. And that's why that 7,000 RENA number is a floor and not a ceiling for the amount that we need to pave the way for because we have to expect that not all of the sites that can accommodate affordable housing will, or that they will to the extent um, that they could. And we also don't always have a lot of control over what range of affordability those units are constructed at. And the way that the current arena is um, constructed, there not only is a certain um, number of affordable units that we have to pave the way for, but they also are broken down into levels of affordability, which makes it even more complex um, because we have to meet certain numbers for certain ranges, not just an overall number of affordability. And if a builder comes in and doesn't build um, anything more than what the minimum is that the city requires, um, then we do have to make sure we, ha we have another place to um, accommodate that. If we didn't, then we would have to um, then re-examine our housing element if we found ourselves in a place where we ran out of those spaces. And so it's something that we want to try to avoid um, from happening to begin with. Um, and I also would just touch really lightly on the um, home sharing thing. When we look at the arena and the affordable units, I think the thing to point out is that those are associated with actual units and not behavior of how those units are used. So you may have someone in a home now that's interested in home sharing. Someone else could live in that home five or 10 years from now and it might, might not be the same. And so I think that's part of why um, those things aren't considered now. Um, moving forward, anything is possible. It's a really quickly changing landscape when it comes to housing. So I wouldn't be super surprised if we see something different in the future. Question from Joe. I recently read that the City Building Commission blocked the plan for an exterior elevator for Draper University, which may result in Draper moving out. Given the problem with many vacant business spaces in San Mateo, is this decision being reviewed? Um, so that's really a, a um, it, it's definitely a land use question, not so much related to the general plan. It is related to um, our development process though, which is an output of the general plan. So no decisions were made on the Draper University. They went through planning commission for a study session to get feedback on a design that they were proposing. And they were given feedback that um, their design needed some work um, in order to be able to move forward. And so, um, that's something that there would be a path forward on if both sides were willing to look at an evolving design. Um, and so um, I would just point out again, that was a study session, not a decision. It was feedback on a design that was proposed. And um, should the applicant choose to move forward, um, they could. Next question from Lisa. How and when will the opportunity to convert excess commercial space to affordable housing be considered as a part of the general plan? Um, I think that'll happen as we move through these next steps and figure out what the community wants to see in terms of housing, numbers of housing units, where the, they go and how they go. Um, and also how we're looking um, at the housing element and our site inventory. We're studying um, all the properties in the city right now, site by site, property by property. It's very intensive and depending on um, what the result is of all of that study, we'll have to figure out what kind of things we need to consider. And also what we hear for the community, what kind of things the community wants us to consider. And so we will start, start to look at that. Um, I'm not sure what excess commercial space will mean because we are also gonna be looking at commercial space and um, we don't know exactly what our commercial future is gonna look like just yet. And so, um, I would say stay tuned. We're, we're interested to figure out how um, some of these things are going to look as you are. Next question from Ronnie. Uh, why are San Mateo's RENA numbers so high? We have much higher numbers than South San Francisco, for example. And given they will be adding a huge number of jobs in biotech, 
How is this possible that our numbers are so much higher than theirs? So it's a complex question with a lot of nuance and a lot of details. Um, the RENA is based off of a methodology that is um, developed with a big group of people over a long period of time. It's based on Plan Bay Area, which is ABAG's big plan for um, the region on how and where it grows and, and where they see things. Um, it's also based on where jobs are, where housing is, and where transit is, and where it's available, and how people move through the Bay Area to live and work. And so um, the methodology resulted in um, San Mateo having a high number, probably in large part because of its location. Um, we have jobs, we have houses, we have a lot of transit, we have transit stations. Um, why it's different than one particular city over another, you, you'd need to go a little deeper to look at that. Um, if you wanna have some more information about, um, you know, more, more detailed and more in depth about that, I think we could do that. Um, it'd be probably a good conversation to have with our housing manager. And so again, for anyone on here who has questions that we're not able to answer all the way or that maybe go a little deeper than we're gonna have time for today, there's a contact us at the bottom right of your screen, generalplanetcityofsanmateo.org. Those questions will come to staff and we can respond to you that way. And if we need to put you in touch with someone who's not here today, we can do that as well. So I would urge you, um, if you, if you want a more um, in-depth conversation about something or to, to learn about something, we can, um, we can assist you offline. Next question, new housing should emphasize spaces for emergency workers, such as police, fire, hospital professionals, healthcare, and other emergency related people, so that if there is a disaster, we will be taken care of. Also teachers should get preference on housing. Is this being considered? Um, that's something we consider through our affordable housing programs. That's something that could also be considered as we move through the housing element. Um, and looking um, at the overarching goals and policies and what the vision is for the city. And so um, it is something that we think about all the time and some of our affordable housing projects that we've seen do have um, requirements that allow for um, different parts of the community or different segments of the community to have um, priority. Next question from Mark. How will the process take into account expected changes in work patterns post pandemic, such as fewer in person office jobs? It sounds yeah. like a similar question. Yeah, I think we got that question earlier okay. and we're still waiting to see how it's gonna turn out. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. With the projected housing density and roadways, will the general plan take into consideration the safety of getting all residents quickly out of the area during a significant disaster, such as a wildfire or earthquake? Yeah, we do have a safety element um, and we will consider um, we will consider all of that. Um, we, we, we have a hazard mitigation plan for the city as well. And so we have a variety of tools that uh, we use. Um, each department has um, emergency plans in place. And so we look at that in a variety of ways, including in the general plan. Um, that is an important, very important element um, while they all are, but, but yes, the answer is yes, we will look at that. Next question from Ronnie. Are protections being built into the general plan for business? businesses and residents that are threatened with displacement and future development? Um, so nothing is built into the general plan just yet because we're still exploring and seeing what it's gonna look like and how it's gonna function and what the contents are gonna be and how it reflects the community's goal. Um, if we refer back to one of our er earlier slides, displacement was one of the things for the technical evaluation that we would look at. So when we get to the place, where we've looked at the alternatives and we have a scenario and we get into that technical level of detail, displacement is one of the things that will be considered. Next question from Lisa. Will you continue to be diligent to identify people at all general plan outreach events and all surveys um, to understand who they are, not personal identity, but similar to the questions we asked today. Um, it is important to understand the perspective from which a person asks a question or makes a comment. Yes, and so we've heard a lot about that and um, we, are, we are adjusting our questions. I think I actually had saw a question earlier on one of our polling questions that may need just a little bit more adjusting. 
we're adjusting our stuff all the time to try to figure out who we're hearing from and to match up what we're hearing from who we're hearing it from so that when we present things to city council and to the general plan subcommittee and when we make all of this information available that it's really clear who we're hearing from and what we're hearing from who because we have heard that there's a lot of interest in that and so we're trying to be really careful and transparent about our tracking um, and disclosure of the information that we're getting through our outreach events. Next question from Seema. I know the city was studying whether it's possible to meet our arena allocation within the existing zoning and restrictions imposed by Measure Y. Has a determination been made yet? What are potential options if we can't meet both arena and Measure Y within our current zoning? And there's a comment following. Uh, they just wanted to note that many San Mateans have based on Measure Y results don't feel that increased height negatively impacts the feel of community. Sure, we realize that there's a lot of um, differing opinions on this matter. And um, to answer the question, that is something we're looking at right now. I mentioned we are going site by site, property by property, and looking at the potential to accommodate housing. Um, we're crunching the numbers now, and we should have some information on that in the next couple of weeks in terms of whether or not the study area could accommodate this next arena cycle. And if so, what does that mean um, for future arenas and what does it mean um, to the general plan? And so we're studying that we have not made the determination yet. Um, once we have some more numbers, we'll be, be moving forward um, with city council status updates. Once we, we obtain meaningful information um, we're going to be doing city council status updates about every quarter anyway, um, and so it could be that this next one lines up um, with us having um, more information from that site's inventory, and so we'll share it when we have it. We don't have it yet, um, and we'll be also just sharing information and status updates in general. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but we, we do plan to go to city council quarterly, even if there is nothing going on, just to make sure everyone has an idea of where we're at. So it's 11.29. Do you want to try for one more question, Christina? Or sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we only got one, one minute, so let's see, what, let's see what happens. Okay, so the next question from M. Are you researching ways other progressive communities like Vancouver, Portland, and Cambridge use to increase housing that also protects the integrity, integrity of the community and environment? We're always looking at other cities and other communities to see what we can learn from them. We get a lot of literature and publications and articles and you know, a lot of the consultants that we use have their hands in a lot of different, different communities as well. And so, yeah, that's a big part of planning. We're always, always looking at and borrowing from each other and sharing information and trying to learn how we can do things better. And so we definitely do look at those progressive cities um, and see what kind of models they may be able to provide for us, um, not just for this topic, but for all kinds of things. It's, it's what we do on a regular basis. Whenever we're making changes, we're always checking with um, neighbors and other communities. Uh, so it is 1130 okay. and the last question did ask if this session could be extended to answer all questions, um, but you had mentioned they could also write us, correct? So I'm sorry, unfortunately, we're not able to extend the session today. Um, I know that we do have a few more questions to go. Um, you can contact us directly if you wanna have a conversation before, but we are gonna post the responses to all of the answers online. So you'll see all of the questions from this meeting and from the last meeting. You'll see all of the responses to all of the questions from this meeting and last me meeting including the ones that, that we were unable to get to today. And so, um, wait, how many more do we have? We have about seven. Are they, seven questions. are they um, duplicative or are they all new? Yeah. No, they seem, they seem individual. All yeah, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to do that today. We have other, um, our, our folks on the call, our panelists who have um, other, other things to do following the meeting, but you will get the information and we are happy to talk to you um, and we will provide it all where you can easily access it. We'll provide the slides as well. 
Um, and so for now, I think we just want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I think it was a good Q and A. Um, I hope that it was informative for everyone. We know we need to do more. Um, some of these questions spill over really cleanly into um, ARENA um, project that we're working on and into the workshops we're having next week. And so you could also participate then. We hope to see you participate at those meetings as well and tune in. And some of your questions might also do well there because I see a lot of them are related to um, the housing element. So. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get time for, for everyone. I think we got to, to 55 out of them. And so um, again, we, it sounds like we have maybe about six more to go and we will post those. So um, thank you all for your questions and for your thoughtfulness and for joining us here today. We realize um, that it's a Saturday and that it's your personal time and that it's important to you. And um, we're glad that you recognize how important the general plan is to the community. And we hope to see you at our coming meeting. And thanks to um, all of our staff for being here and helping to support um, the effort in the workshop today. Have a nice